now to the first, the EU itself. The EU is a supranational organization, a supranational organization. By supra, we simply mean it sits above, it brings together a series of nation states. It is a supranational institution, one that sits above nation states. It is created by virtue of treaties, treaties that have been pursued at the behest of nation states. And by virtue of these treaties, the EU has acquired some authority, we could even say some sovereignty, over member states. And if we look at the legislative competency that the EU possesses, it includes of, uh, we can go disciplines as wide as agriculture, research, goods, labor, capital, the list goes on and on. Now there are two core treaties, two core treaties to the EU itself. The Treaty of Rome from 1957 that has been renamed the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union, which has been updated and consolidated in 2012. And we also have the Treaty of Maastricht of 1992, which is otherwise known as the Treaty of the European Union, which was updated in 2012 also. So we have the Treaty of Maastricht, and we have the Treaty of Rome. Each one has been renamed. The Treaty of Maastricht is now the Treaty of the European Union, and the Treaty of Rome is referred to as the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. Since Maastricht, meaning since 1992, all citizens of member states are also considered European citizens. All citizens of member states are also considered European citizens. Now, there are important implications to this designation. There are important implications here, including the acquisition of rights across all member states, rights that include residency, the right to reside, access to medical services, and access to benefits. Now, think about that in practical terms. You're a UK citizen, and you decide, well, you know what, I'd like you to live in Spain. So you travel to Spain, you lease a flat, you look for work, but in the meantime you can't find work, so you apply for unemployment security, unemployment insurance, however they term it in Spain, and you have access to that, and you apply for a child benefit because you go there with your partner and with your children, and you are eligible for all of that as a UK citizen, not because you are a UK citizen, but because you are a European citizen. And both Spain and the UK are member states of the EU. And as member states, via the Treaty of Maastricht, all citizens of member states are European citizens and thus enjoy those benefits. Now imagine again, many of you are coming here from the United States, from Canada, from Australia, from other parts of the world. If you wanted to move somewhere else, well, you have to apply for a visa. You required a visa just to come here to study. You have to apply for a visa, and you certainly would not have access to many of the benefits. So if you were to look at my visa, it's a work visa, it says on it, on my passport, if you look at the visa, no recourse to public funds. Very clearly, no recourse to public funds. I do not have access to that. If I were coming here from Germany, well, first, I wouldn't need the visa. And second, I do have recourse to public funds. Because if I were German, I would be a European citizen. Now, in trying to understand the rights here, rights of residency, rights to medical services, rights to benefits, what we have to understand are the core functions of the European Union. There's a link there. There's an association. The EU is establishing what is effectively a free trading area. A free trading area where there is movement of capital, where there is movement of goods. So we eliminate the tariffs, we eliminate the subsidies, so as to facilitate the movement of capital and goods. But we also need to facilitate the movement of workers. Because here we are trying to use this free trading area as a means of stimulating the European economy. So we're stimulating European economy and we need workers to have that freedom of movement 
to go effectively where the work is. So it's almost a quid pro quo. In exchange for the freedom to move capital and goods, there is also the freedom of workers to move from place to place. But as workers move from place to place, well, first thing, they need to be able to take up residency. They can't work in a place if they can't reside there. But also while they're there, there is that period, that interim period where they're looking for work. There is that inter interim period where they're changing jobs. And we need to be able to compensate them for that time until we provide them with access to the services that are available to locals. And medical services, well, that goes hand in hand with the approach that Europe takes towards that particular issue. Now, to facilitate all of the above, to facilitate those rights, to facilitate that free trading area, the EU has been granted a series of legislative powers. Now, we spoke before about the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe is an alliance, if you will, an alliance of member states around particular issues, human rights, rule of law, and democracy. But the EU itself goes a little bit further. And the EU is an attempt to articulate, to formalize a competing vision of the future of Europe competing, possibly complementary, than the one that comes through from the Council of Europe. So if we look at the Council of Europe, the Council of Europe is communicating, is conveying one vision of Europe. It's a Europe that is bound together by treaties, treaties that encourage cooperative action. So we're encouraging member states to take a similar approach towards human rights. We have the European Convention of Human Rights, we have the European Court of Human Rights. And as we said last week, we have the UK with its dualist position, and it is not required to implement rulings of the European Court, but it is encouraged to do so. And ultimately, the UK could withdraw from the European Convention if it wanted to. So that is one vision, cooperative action that is built around a series of treaties. And then we have a second vision, and that is where we turn to the EU. The EU represents a form of uh, sovereign, even, if you will, a federal Europe. Churchill referred to it as the United States of Europe. A federal vision of Europe in which one body, the EU, engages in a form of supervision, engages in forms of in legislative action on behalf of all member states. And what we see within the EU then are three core pillars, three pillars. The first one are the three distinct communities of the EU, three distinct communities which form the EU. The first is the European coal and steel community, so a community that was built around particular resources. The second was the European atomic community, European atomic community. And the third, so we've got the first, second, and third. The third, the European, which you've heard of probably most of all, the European Economic Community. These are subsumed, these three communities are subsumed within the EU itself, the first pillar of the EU. We have a second pillar, and that within the EU there is agreed cooperation in foreign affairs and matters of security. We have this issue arising at the moment around refugees. How are we to deal with refugees? And what we see then are heads of states getting together and trying to hammer out an EU approach towards resolving it. So this could be dealt with by individual member states, and some individual member states have taken initiatives um, abandoning uh, ships in the Mediterranean, building walls, imprisonment, whatever approach that they take. But then there is also this collective approach where they're trying to hammer out a form of distribution, equitable distribution of the refugees. So this is a matter of foreign affairs, 
a matter on some level of security as well. And the third pillar is the agreed cooperation in home affairs and in justice. In home affairs and in justice. Now that is the EU itself. It possesses a form of sovereignty. It possesses a series of responsibilities. It possesses legislative competency in a select few areas. And it possesses this by virtue of two key treaties, two key treaties that have been signed by the member states. And when they signed it, they became member states, and they effectively agreed to cede some of their sovereignty to the EU over key aspects of uh, social regulation.